This is episode two of season one mm-hmm. uh, of the Indie Wood podcast, where we talk about indie film and uh, the many hats that indie filmmakers wear. Welcome, Indie. Thank you for coming back on. Of course. Uh, just give me like a one sentence blurb about you, just to reintroduce folks that sure. didn't watch episode one. Hi, everyone. My name is Indiana, and I am a DP based in Los Angeles, originally from Canada. I'm also the co founder of Cinematography for Actors, that spe- specializes in bridging the gap between talent and crew. That's where we are shooting today at the CFA studio. And I am delighted to be a resource for you, Yaro, you. on your first season of Thank Indiewood. You. I'm, I'm excited to have you on. And uh, the first episode, we talked about your workflow and mm-hmm. some interesting kind of uh, things that you bring to your projects that um, make them better. Mm-hmm. But uh, today we're going to talk about screenwriting. Yeah, I'm excited. I, and I think screenwriting is is just fundamental to every job on set. And some people are like, no, I don't read the script. I just come in, I put up lights. And, and I feel like the folks who do read whatever pages you have for the day, or even better, the whole script, they can understand uh, the whole cake. Okay. I guess. Let's, let's, let's go with the cake analogy. The whole cake and uh, make better... Uh, decisions for their section of the cake, like right. frosting or the batter or the, you know, decorations. Sprinkles. Or whatnot. Mm, so uh, let's start with what is your experience with screenwriting and how do you implement it into your workflow? It's really funny. I have two things here, quick things, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Um, I just saw American Fiction, which was amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they have a whole joke in there about, um, I think, the literary agent is booked. Um, based in Chicago and they're talking about how this director is going to turn it into a movie and they were worried about him like finding out some stuff in the plot um, but they made a joke saying you know the executives aren't even reading the scripts it's just summarized by assistants the whole town runs off book reports and I found that hilarious it's first so of all true. everyone gets cliff notes <laughs> yeah I love it yeah. and the second piece of my experience with screenwriting is I am technically dating a screenwriter now that's true who is now directing but is trained at, who went to the screenwriting program at AFI Mm -hmm. and so I get to hear about I'm only now learning about that process more and more and also get to see him in action when writing and how he's blocking it out and the note cards and stuff and so it's very new to me I feel completely uncomfortable with uh, great this is a perfect second episode yes yeah because I feel very uncomfortable with I wouldn't even know how to sit down and I would know to maybe do an outline, but I wouldn't know how to sit down and actually format it or mm. write it out or how you do dialogue. Like I, it's it's a mystery to me. So here's a a, a weird secret that nobody from the screenwriting world, from the screenwriting world, will ever tell you. Okay. And uh, I'll probably have to fight for my life after I reveal this this hidden gem. <laughs> uh, you do what you want. Yeah. You just make it up. You you have your own workflow. Mm-hmm. Granted, when you're first starting. I think it's it's very important to understand the fundamentals, mm-hmm. acts, sequences, scenes, beats, uh, motivations, character interactions, you know, how act one relates to act three, how the first half of the film relates to the second half of the film. Those are really important things to learn. Yeah. And then, for example, how do you outline? It's like, well, how do you want to outline? Right. You know, I think if you in if you maintain those like uh, fundamental chunks Mm -hmm. of your screenwriting process, you can modify it in any way you see fit. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I actually want to interrogate you about it because please do. Are you looking at the page count to know when act one is done and act two and act three? Yes, I do. I, well in the beginning, uh, right. As I kind of got out of grad school, uh, I did a lot more. And I think maybe before grad school too, because I I was kind of self-trained before I jumped into, into UCLA and I wasn't great, but I wasn't bad. Like, you know, I wrote stuff. Mm-hmm. It was bad, but I wrote <laughs> stuff. Uh, and so initially it was like, okay, well, I'm getting to, you know, uh, this this transition in my act. I I can't, you know, uh, do anything else in this moment. Or yeah. it's like, oh, my inciting incident is, you know, five pages too early or five pages too late. And so after I got out of grad school, I was like, oh, I can, I, I know the rules now. I should be, you know, do this more. But I, what I learned learned through kind of working on my own scripts and, and to seeing what's successful or not, and I've had some success, which has been really cool, is that it's more of a guideline. 
And that's what all these filmmaking rules are. It's like we learn them in order to understand how to make movies. Mm -hmm. But then when we get to making movies, they're guidelines. This is art. You don't, you know, we don't all paint like Rembrandt. We don't all paint like uh, Picasso or sorry, Da Vinci, you know, they, they made these fundamental rules for art, but then people went in and were like, Hey, I'm just going to make boxes, you know? And Mondrian was like, look, it's a box that's red and blue and there's a line between it. Now it's art. And so, um, you make up your own rules within the guidelines of these kind of foundational truths that we've all learned. And so for screenwriting now, um, when I get to, let's say my first act break, Mm -hmm. that is usually within 25 to 35 pages. Like it falls within that 10 page, you know, because you'll, you'll notice, I mean, I do this with films all the time. Uh, When you hit the 20 minute mark, it's like you're in it. And for me, I have this rule. If I get past 20 minutes, I'll watch a film. Mm. If I don't, I'm I'm never going to go back to it. Right. There's been a couple of, uh, a couple of, uh, what's it called? exceptions to that rule but i won't name them in case Mm -hmm. uh in case i'll have to work with those folks in the future do you think that based on you say 25 to 35 pages Mm -hmm. that's the range for act one do you think genre changes that do you think comedy you're 25 Mm -hmm. pages or drama you're 35 i think it's story dependent you know i I, maybe maybe there'll be a shift of a couple pages here and there uh for genre but i i think it's story dependent some stories want things to happen sooner some stories want things to happen later. And, and, and uh, this happens a lot with my inciting incident is sometimes it's, it's supposed to quote unquote be on page 12, right? That that's kind of the golden rule. But honestly, sometimes you want it to happen on six. Yeah. Sometimes it happens a little later, but when you kind of shift that rule, for example, that inciting incident rule, when you shift it to later or earlier in the script, there has to be, I don't want to say motivation, but there has to be a reason, yeah. right? So you can't just be like, oh, it's going to happen earlier, so it's more exciting. No. Why is it happening earlier? You know, what are you putting in that space that the inciting incident should be in? And mm-hmm. are you spending enough time setting up your story? So there, there's things to consider. Are you, when you're writing, say you're not directing something that's that mm-hmm. you've written, mm-hmm. um, there's a story of Greta Gerwig for Little Women, mm-hmm. um, and they were doing rehearsals because on dialogue-wise, um, people si- the sisters were talking over each other, mm-hmm. and so it was written like there would be three people talking at the same time, two people talking, and you had to get it right with your cues. If you're not directing something you've written, are you re- trying to relay that in your story to have it told that way, or as a writer, when you give it a script away you're like I don't really care like how do you write I guess my question is fast dialogue and how do you make sure that it's interpreted that way you know for me I think I'm different Mm -hmm. because I write stories where people listen Mm. and so there isn't ever a overlap and so whenever there is something that happens at least for my stories it's always an interruption Mm. but uh, I I, you know looking at that script and, and scripts that have overlapping dialogue the story I keep hearing is nobody wants to like read it you know so minimize your overlapping dialogue because it's annoying however uh you know for a film like maestro which has a lot of dialogue happening all at once it's uh, a tool in the screenwriter's tool belt but it should never be overused Mm. um because once you start overusing it things get really muddy and complicated and exhausting for the for the listener uh, and I think when you translate that to a, a directorial thing, you know, it's are they overlapping because you're trying to show off or are they overlapping because it's the moment calls for it, the story calls for it. Got it. And so when it does happen, you know, you have this formatting thing in dialogue where the dialogue isn't under each other. It's next to each other. Mm-hmm. And um, a lot of folks use that and it works. And I think if you have something that intentionally must be said over each other, then you deliver it in that way. But if there's room for, you know, exploring, then then you don't. Are Psychologically, are you trying to manipulate the director to direct the film a certain way based yeah. off of how you're writing it? Oh, yeah. Oh. I am. I am like, <laughs> because being a director, um, wearing many hats and, and, and kind of being my own my own creative, I, I feel like I'm, I'm manipulating people into. And that's what it is. Screenwriting is a manipulation mm-hmm. because you're trying to convey what you see in your head mm-hmm. to somebody else. And when people are like, oh, no, I'm a screenwriter. I don't direct. But you are. 
Like you are creating a scene, you're creating blocking, like you're you're basically building the blueprint and a lot of people call screenplays blueprints. You're building the blueprint for a film. Doesn't matter if it's twenty five dollars, twenty five thousand dollars, or twenty five million dollars. Like it's still the same thing. And I think that's what just to digress a little bit. That's the cool thing about screenwriters cool. is you can do that in a vacuum mm-hmm. and you can make a hundred million dollar movie. Without having the budget. Without having the budget. Do yeah. you what are some tips for manipulating the director in your in your writing? Crap. See, I always just m- manipulate myself. <laughs> Um, don't do uh, camera direction. direction. Camera direction. Yeah, yeah unless I've heard you that. are creating a production draft and you're the director, don't do camera direction. Because mm-hmm. um, it turns people off of how they want to do it, or it's t- or it's taking away from the story. Uh, that okay? Because you know, I I, I think from for me, and, and yeah. I think there will be people that be like, no, you're wrong. Um, because welcome to film. Yes, and welcome to any film because <laughs> everyone has their own rules. People don't necessarily hate it. And maybe it'll take you out of the script, but it's it's like you don't want to tell someone else how to do their job. And that's a very direct way Got of like, it. hey, put the camera in the corner, shoot it this way. Yeah, yeah. But when I write stuff and I want things to look a certain way, I'll use it in a slug line. So, for example, I want a close up on an object or someone's eye in my slug line. I'll have, you know, a close up eyeball and then I'll do a little action block to describe what's happening. Got it. You know, um, that's kind of you you refine your storytelling approach to visually tell the story before you get into the dialogue. Got it. Yeah. Now, Drake, and I'm always going to pronounce this wrong, Drake Dormus, the director of um, like crazy Mm, and stuff, he is primarily improv, Mm -hmm. but he's a writer too. I didn't actually look up those scripts, but how do you write improv? (laughs) <laughs> don't. Like, is it that you write the scene and where it yeah. takes place, but then well, you say they talk about coffee yeah, or they talk yeah. about... I think so. I've never wrote improv yeah. just because I, I've always wanted my stories to be kind of intentional, but this is the same thing that happened with Gareth Edwards' first film. He just did The Creator, which we spoke about last episode. He His first film, one of my favorite films, has the best final line of dialogue in any movie I've ever seen. Uh, so we'll see it. Um, what is the movie? It's called Monsters. Monsters. Yeah, Got it. Okay. Monsters. It's with Scooty McNary and his wife, uh, who, whose name I can't remember. I'm so sorry. So they, it's a, it's a, it's a sci-fi story about this, this duo mm-hmm. going home. Got Along it. the way, they may or may not fall in love. And the whole thing's improv. Mm-hmm. And so Gareth Edwards, he bought a camera. The story goes is he bought a camera, uh, pitched this to a production company. They gave him $100,000 to go to Mexico. He went to Mexico rented a van got his two actors got a fixer and an audio guy and that's it Mm -hmm. and he shot the whole thing and directed the whole thing himself yeah i wonder because you're like you probably still have at least the director who's also the writer there gareth edwards Edwards, even if you don't have an ad you're still having to like board it out like strip board or like create Mm -hmm. a schedule so i imagine you need some sort of script or something to break it down right i'd love to talk to him about about it but i know adobe did a couple of interviews with him Mm -hmm. about that yeah kind of workflow and process um you know, from my approach, if I was to do an improv, some something that was improv, and I'd like to in the future, it would be to outline it, and and give give the story a scene structure. So we go from location A to location B, and then this happens, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and give my actors parameters and kind of guardrails to yeah. work within, and then just explore and have fun on the day. You know, I've always wanted to do like a like a, a, a I guess it would be like a long take, but it's more of a theater performance. Mm-hmm that is recorded and then is becomes a movie. Yeah. And so like a, it's a, it's a like long, like 20, 30, right. 40 minute takes just because it's theater and you could do that. Um, my questions for you are how do you utilize the script in your workflow? It depends on the DP, but for me personally, you, the script is the only thing I have to go from normally. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I don't work commercial, like I said. And so, um, it's not boarded out normally, uh, for me. And I, I don't work with a lot of directors that come with an idea. They have an idea of what they want, but they don't, they haven't shot listed yet. It's more just me reading the script and talking about it. And so I do two passes of a script. I do one where I don't make any notes and I just read through Mm -hmm. it and as an audience member. And then the second one I go through and I start to go like, here are the main characters, um, how are they kind of written about, uh, what are the locations, what are the vibes, what has the director done in the past? And so I start to like inform the way that I would tell that story based off of all of the stuff I can pull from the script and mm-hmm. the director's private prior work. Um, and so I actually, 
in the first pass, I'm paying attention to dialogue. And in the second pass, I'm not paying attention to dialogue whatsoever um, because I'm more trying to figure out how this would be shot feasibility because I know getting into an interview with that director, that producer, that the first thing they're going to ask me is like, can you see us doing this in X amount of days? Can, would you be okay with a crew yeah. like this? And they're going to ask me a lot of production related stuff rather than creative because a lot of people... I think assume that the director has all the answers and I think they have all the answers to take it in the right direction. But when actually filling in the answers of like how we can achieve this or, or alternative ways, um, I think that's where I come in. So yeah, I, I use it as, um, my, my only tool at the beginning that I have to go from and kind of, hopefully I'm on the same page with that director. And if not, then, and we're not looking like we're going to tell the same movie, Maybe then it's, it's not, not the, the match yeah. and that's totally cool, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything with a screenplay where you're reading it and you're like, oh, I don't understand enough about this structural part or something like functional about a screenplay that may not be crucial to the way you have your workflow set up, mm -hmm. but, you know, maybe beneficial to other people or, or you've seen other people kind of explore? It's interesting. I'm trying to think of like recent scripts I've interviewed for where I've read something and been like, I'm going to have to talk to them about that because mm -hmm. I often, here's a, here's a yeah. question. So you have your traditional sub line, which is interior or exterior mm -hmm. period location or multiples, you know, location refinement. So yeah. lo bigger location, smaller location and so forth. And then day or night. Have you seen any slug lines that were just unconventional and three for a loop? That's interesting. I, I think I'm trying to think of like the craziest scripts I've read. I think what I hate is it's always like this is my brain as a DP is I think I'm reading a script and I look at it as like how we're going to block this out mm -hmm. or in a in a shooting schedule and how the director is going to block it out. And I hate when it says continued. Like I hate when oh, it goes interior, yeah. blah, 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 continued. And I'm like, oh, the AD is going to make that another scene or the director is going to talk about it in another like block of setups rather than us just looking at it as so one scene. When you say continued, is it continued in the slug line yeah so it goes like in uh, interior living room um and then we do a scene it says interior living room continued mm. and i'm like why are why do we have that next thing because when we have a shooting script that ad is going to block that as a separate scene yeah they're going to in in the strip board well see i think this is where uh, for me this is how i approach continued and how i use it yeah it's usually when i'm transferring locations but the take doesn't stop yeah right so it's like we're going from bathroom to living room to mm -hmm. outside and so i'll have those as separate sug lines with continued but it's it, we're, con we're just running through and yeah. I, I think i've evolved a little bit in my writing to maybe not do that so much where i even just completely destroy my slug line where i'll have my setup like interior bathroom day Right. And then I'll have my scene and then the character runs out too, and I go dash dash. And then the next slug line just says living room. Yeah. Right. 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 And then I'll write a scene and then they go and then they run through the open door too. And then, you know, dash dash. And then I'll go outside. Mm -hmm. Right. So like it, it actually helps flow the story flow better uh, from my, my opinion. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe would be a better use of continued because sometimes you know, you have continued, you're like, well, it's a separate scene. Yeah, but exactly. Usually if it's... If and it's the same time of day, and I'm, I'm looking at it like, okay, they just served tea, and now it's continued. Is it continued because they've been drinking tea, and they're on their second yeah. pot, or is mm -hmm. it like they're continued because now she's brought back the tea, and they're in the living room again, and we're just continued? You See, know? if it's... if it's The way I distinguish the, 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 the those kind of two different concepts is, you know, e e either it'll flow into the next scene, mm -hmm. audib like, not audibly, but... Um, story-wise yeah and it'll feel just like a continuation or uh, i have this thing which is i think kind of annoying sometimes maybe for people to read where i'll have a scene something happens i'll get to the end and then it, let's say cuts to 20 minutes later right i'll just go new slug line same scene later got it dash yes. later yeah and then continue and uh i think when you when you bog down people in information in your slug line then it can lead to kind of people doing a double take which you don't ever want to do yeah. on, on your screenplay. Yes. Um, Especially for yeah. when you're starting to hire people out and your HODs are reading it and just trying to figure out what kind of story you're telling before that first interview or you got the job and you're reading through it and you're just like, okay, where do I want to start here? What's mm -hmm. the most important 
thing is it breaking down the pacing and how much we're going to cover it based off of the rules around pacing because I see it's fast or I see there's a lot of description so I know it's going to be slower you know I can like read a script and understand I think how quickly we're telling that story or how long we're in that scene based off the description of like poetry or you yeah. know like we see you know cups on the table and then the carpet is like there's a dirty stain in the corner and, and then i just know <sighs> yeah. i'm like okay so i'm gonna have like eight close-up i'm gonna have like eight specials or i'm gonna mm -hmm. have like you know all of this coverage um because they made a point to like you're talking about they made a point to talk about it um versus the when there's no description and it's just like dialogue 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 back and forth back and forth back and forth for sometimes, five pages sometimes too much uh description can be, I think, I don't want to say the evidence of a bad writer, mm -hmm. because you know what, uh, I've read Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, and mm -hmm. it had blocks of text. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, blocks of action, right, and descriptor. And I was like, man, that's dry, yeah. but it's a great film. Oh, so good. And I remember my first film, my first feature that I finished, had like three pages of just this living room, right. And I read it and I was like, damn, that's good. But also it's three pages of yeah. me describing yeah. a living room. I mean, every DP would read that and mm -hmm. be like, okay, we're going to be in the living room a while like looking at it. 20 minutes, yeah. Yeah, we're going to have like a slow push in on the living room mm -hmm. and then maybe cut away to some like specials, you know? So it's, uh, yeah, it's it's funny because as a director, as a writer, you're probably writing it just because you're like, I want to remember that this is the world I want to create. Mm -hmm. But as a DP, I'm reading it going like, okay, that's our visual language, you know? Like, that's how long we're going to be holding on revealing what the living room is. So it's interesting. I think for folks who are writing and directing and or shooting their own film, uh, you know, it's it's important to not only be clear for your story, mm -hmm. but also for the people you collaborate with. Yeah. Having a good understanding of how other people's, uh, how other people and other creative, creatives perceive your um visuals your story your your audio um is is just as important as a story itself yeah. because you can have a great story and then people are reading it like i don't understand any of this yeah that then can make or break your project and i think uh you know being concise and clear not getting bogged down in you know over describing something because while people do it Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy, those are also established writers who yeah. have the the pull, I guess, yeah. to demand someone read their blocks of text. Absolutely. Um, you want to hear something kind of fun, though? Yeah. So um, what I've started to do with scripts that I ex at, at, like shoot mm -hmm. is... Um, is I've started making them into books and I give oh, the fun. director a book an AD a book and a producer the book of the script. I like that. And then on set, it's soft cover. And then on set, I we have that as like our note Bibles. Oh, that's so, so it's cool. not just like printed out that you're leaving somewhere and it's folded up. It's actually mm. into like a pocket book. So mm. I reformat it. So it's like a five by six, like little pocket book. Yeah, so you do have pages. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, yes. And so you're just kind of like, like what sides would be, I guess, and stuff yeah. when they're printed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, I've started making that and I give it out to the HODs for fun. And then at the end, I get everyone to sign it. I put it on a little shelf and I have all my, my stuff. So even for shorts, I do that it now. That is so cool. And you know, I'm oh. going to give everyone a hot tip on how to do that on a cheap way because you can okay. put it in your budget. See, I, I'm glad you brought this up because I yeah. want to send some family scripts of mine. Oh, yeah. Because they've asked, like, oh, I'm going to read it. And I was like, let yeah. me give you uh, the book of it. But yeah, yeah I'll tell you the yeah. way of doing it cheap. So books can be expensive to make. They don't have to be if you sign up for an Amazon KDP account, which is mm. Kindle Direct Publishing, and okay. you sign up and you, um, without publishing it, you upload that, you tell it what format to go into, mm. it'll format it for you, and then you print artist books, and it's $2, Amazon ships it to you in two days, printed, bound, and with its own ISBN if you end up publishing it, but you won't publish it. So it's like um, proofs, right? Yeah, oh, that's and, so cool. and it sends to you, and it's only like $2, and then you can have that's your really good. entire crew, if you have 30 people, you know, it's 60 bucks yeah. to have an entire crew have their own book that script and that you can script put it in a library in a book form you can put it in a library <laughs> you can, and you can also have people with their own notes on it and like sharpie in like this is for the dp and blah blah and i make a cover that like is the title is and so cool. who the hod's are so people know on set um and i find that really useful that is really useful i think i think uh, people treat screenplays like a throwaway yeah and i i don't want to be like oh i'm a writer so treat it with rever reverence yeah reverence reverence rever reverence 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 and i look to jack because he's like <laughs> knows all these things yeah. sometimes yeah there's there's the pronunciation yeah. but you know what it's important because it's so foundational and if we don't treat it better yeah i'm not saying like put on a pedestal or 
you know, just buy a dinner. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. Make it feel good. Well, I just don't think it'll be all ripped up and stained on exactly. set if you have a cover on yeah. it. Um, yeah. And, uh, and people will know that that's the script. You can pick it up and read it. Um, but anyway, so that's my fun little, like, I, I think more people should do that on Go set. Go make books of your screenplays. I think so. Yeah. Well, next week we're going to talk about color grading. I think it's going to be exciting. We're I have gonna, so many questions for you about oh, this. We're going to talk about inputs. Yep. Color space. Delivery. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to ask you fun. about your fun resolve inputs that okay. I learned about when we went to Keslo yeah. because mm. I find that really interesting. It's going to be exciting. And yeah. I never know anything about it. Well, uh, tune in next week. We'll, we'll continue uh, Indie Wood season one. Thank you for listening to the Indie Wood podcast. You can find us on anywhere you find your podcasts and on Instagram at Indie Wood Pod. See you next time. From the CFA Network, produced by Indiana Underhill and Haley Royal. Hosted by Yaroslav Altonen, Cinematography for Actors is bridging the gap through education and community building. Find out about us and listen to our other podcast at cinematographyforactors.com.